In this video, I want to introduce the notion of a factor group, or sometimes called a quotient group. You probably hear me say quotient group more often, although in Tom Judson's textbook, he typically calls them factor groups. It's very, very common, both terms. Uh, in my opinion, factor group is often introduced first uh, in sort of like introductory abstract algebra courses, like the video series you're watching right now. Uh, but as mathematicians mature, it tends to gravitate more towards quotient group. But again, maybe that's just my uh, perspective. It's probably a colloquial thing. There's perhaps different regions in the world that use different uh, terms. For me, being in the Intermountain West, quotient group seems to be the most common term when describing the structure we're going to develop right now. So before we introduce uh, a factor group or a quotient group, let me first introduce the idea of coset multiplication, which is what the factor group's operation is going to be. Now, as a lemma to help us get to the to get to the the coset multiplication. Let's take a subset H of a group G. Let me, and I want to prove, you, prove to you that if you take the product of H times H, so this is the product of sets, the so-called Frobenius product we've introduced earlier in this series. If you take the product of H and H, this gives you back H. So in terms of Frobenius multiplication, a subgroup is actually an idempotent element. Its square is equal to itself. Now, as these are sets, we want to show two sets are equal to each other. Uh, we're going to show their subsets of each other. That proves the inequality. So we're going to first prove that H times H is a subgroup of A, a subset of H. That's what we're going to first do. So take an arbitrary element of HH that we'll call it X. Well, if you belong to HH, that means there's going to be elements little h and little h prime such that X can factor as HH prime. That's what it means to be in the set HH. Everything in HH is a product of something with H with something with H, which those elements do not have to be the same thing. Okay, but H is a subgroup, right? So H is closed under multiplication. So if I take a product of two things in H, I'll get you something in H. So this thing belongs to H and that proves the first direction. HH is, is less than or equal to H. It's contained inside of H. The other direction is fairly simple because if I take something in H, okay, then H can be factored as H times the identity. Because after all, again, it's a subgroup. It will contain the identity, in which case then H times the identity is equal to H, but that's also a product of things inside of H. So HE will be part of HH, and that gives us the other direction. You'll notice here that we assumed that H was a subgroup. We use closure under multiplication. We use the inclusion of the identity. We actually don't need inverses to make this property hold. Just uh, just sort of as a little a little side that I just want to throw out there, that this, this equality held, held even if um, we don't, even, even if we're not closed on the sets, not closed under inverses, which of course it is true for subgroups. All right. So with that definition out of the, or excuse me, that limit out of the way, let's now define the idea of a coset multiplication. So now suppose we have a normal subgroup. What do we know about normal subgroups again? Normal subgroups, we could define those as those subgroups closed under conjugation. So we could think of this way. So G X G inverse belongs to N for all X inside of N and for all g inside of g that gives you that's the that's a diff you could define that to be a normal subgroup that's equivalent to be a normal subgroup this condition of course tells you that g and g inverse is equal to n right it's close it's a uh, it's closed under conjugation which the way we originally defined it which follows from this equation right here we say a subgroup is normal if all of the left cosets are equal to their corresponding right cosets so gn equals ng that's the one we're going to use right here so we have a normal subgroup and take two arbitrary elements of the group G. Now consider the Frobenius products of the cosets AN with BN, all right? So again, what we mean by this is that when you take this AN and this BN, this Frobenius product, we're going to take all the possible products of X and Y where X comes from AN and Y comes from uh, BN, excuse me. So we're just taking all the possible combinations of these products from a n and b n. Okay, so this this is just the Frobenius product which we introduced previously. Now, one thing that's true about the Frobenius product is that it is associative. You can redo the parentheses, and that doesn't change what the product is. And of course, when you see a single element, really you're thinking of it as a singleton, right? These are singletons in terms of that Frobenius product. Now, this is a statement that I made, but we never actually proved. For which, if you want to see a proof of it really quick, it's not a, it's not too difficult of an of a of a really an argument. So if we have sets like X, Y, and Z, which are subsets of a group, not necessarily subgroups, consider X times Y, Z 
as a set, what this is going to look like is it's going to look like the it's going to look like all the possible elements of x times y z, right? As x, well, let's back up a little bit. We'll call this one we'll call this one w for the moment, right? All of the x times w's for which x is in x and w is in yz, okay? But you can then equate that with all the elements x times yz, after all, uh, where x is in x, y is in y, and z is in z. And the connection here, of course, is that what is the set yz? It's just all the possible products of things from y and z, like so. So that's what x times yz looks like. On the other hand, if you look at the set xy times z, this is equal to, well, it's going to look like w times z, where w belongs to xy and z belongs to z. But like we observed above, that w could be replaced with that things of the form y xy times z, where x is in x, y is in y, and z is in z, right? Because after all, what is the set x, y? It's, it's all the possible products of things from x and things from y. And since you're in a group, these things are associative. So element-wise, there's this correspondence between x, y, z and x, y, z. So that'll force equality of these sets. So the Fermi's product is an associative operation. Uh, I just want to make that very explicit here. So as I redo parentheses in situations like this, uh, right, you redo the parentheses, there's no concern whatsoever. The Frobenius product is associative because the group product is associative. If the group was abelian, this would also prove that the Frobenius products are also abelian. The, the products of these sets is abelian. If that, if that was the case, we don't need that right here. All right, so when you look at a n times b n, so this is a product of two cosets. I can redo parentheses, so I get a singleton A times the coset NB times the set N, right? So now this is where normality comes into play. Because the group or the subgroup is normal, we get that NB is the same thing as BN. I can commute those things around, and there's no problem there whatsoever, okay? And so that's this, again, This I'm going to leave this on the screen. This is where normality is actually used. Then we redo parentheses again. This becomes AB times NN. And the previous lemma we just showed that NN is the same thing as N right here. And so then we see that when we highlight what happened here, the product of two cosets is itself a coset. Okay, so this actually defines a multiplication. So if we take the set G mod N, and so the G slash N right there, it's often pronounced G mod N. Uh, that's the set of all left cosets, which... For normal, for normal subgroups, there's no difference between left cosets and right cosets, so you could call it right cosets if you want to. But this it turns out we actually have now a binary operation. I can take a left coset, and I could times that by a left, left coset, and this produces a left coset. So on the set of cosets, I now have a binary operation. What type of operation do we have here? Well, it's an operation that forms a group, and that's this theorem 10.1.12 right here. If you have a normal subgroup, then coset multiplication as it defined above forms a group on the set of cosets. So the set of cosets itself is a group. We made a new group using a group in one of its normal subgroups. And this subgroup, uh, this, 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 uh, this group is called the factor group or the quotient group. And like I said, it's pronounced G mod N when you read this G mod N right here. Okay, so why why is it a group? It has to be associative, has to have an identity, has to have inverses, okay? Associativity, I've already argued to you, right? The Frobenius product is associative, as we just saw, and coset multiplication is just a special case of Frobenius multiplication. So the, in the Frobenius product, we take any product of two subsets of a group. For the coset multiplication, we're just restricting our attention to only Frobenius products of cosets. That's an associative operation, as we've already argued. This operation has an identity, okay? How do we know it has an identity? Well, the idea is the following. If you take EN and you times it by any coset, AN, right? Well, the rule from above gives you that you take EA times N, but as E is the identity, you'll just get back AN. And since you have an associative operation, right? You have an associative operation. If someone walks like a, an identity and quacks like an identity, it's gonna be the identity, right? It's, it's gonna be the identity, it's gonna be unique, great. Same thing with inverses, right? Um, I actually claim that the inverse of a coset GN is just going to be the coset represented by its inverse. How do we know that? Well, take GN and times it by GN inverse. What happens? Well, by the coset multiplication, you're going to get G, G inverse N, 
which those become the identity and the identity is the identity coset is actually the identity of the quotient group right here. And so again, if it walks like an inverse and quacks like an inverse, then it's an inverse. So it has inverses, has identities, and it's associated, boom, it is a group. And that's what we call the quotient group, of course. So I want you to note that we've defined coset multiplication above using the subset multiplication, the Frobenius multiplication in a group, and not based upon the representative of the coset, right? So like I mentioned earlier that since the Frobenius product is associative, uh, we can redo parentheses. And so that's irrelevant of the representation. So when you talk about like AN and BN, right? You could choose different representatives that would change this product AB, but that wouldn't change the coset ABN. Like the representatives could change, but the coset would still be the same. And so we've defined coset multiplication using the Frobenius product, which is well defined, is irrelevant of the, of the representation here, but it does require that it be a normal subgroup in order for this equality to be validated. Now, oftentimes when, when a, in like a first semester abstract algebra course, when they define coset multiplication, they don't introduce the Frobenius product and all of this intermediate stuff is missing. And they're just like, oh, we're just gonna say that this coset times this coset is equal to this coset. And then they have to go through this long, tedious argument that this multiplication is well-defined, that it doesn't depend on the representative. Um, we, of course, I mean, it's gonna take some effort to develop, but we we took the approach that we defined it using the Frobenius multiplication for which no tedious, well-defined argument is necessary here because we've already established that. But we also have the benefit of we can use the Frobenius product for other things in addition to coset multiplication. So we don't have to prove that at all. Um, also, another thing to another thing to be aware of is when you were talking about the quotient group G mod n, the elements of the quotient group are cosets, right? Not elements of G. So G mod n is a set of sets. Those sets being, of course, called cosets. So the elements of the of the factor group are not elements of the group. They're actually subsets of the of the group itself. So that distinction is important. Let's look at a couple of examples here. So we have to take groups with, with normal subgroups, and then we can talk about a quotient group. So let's take the group S3, and let's take its normal subgroup, the alternating group, A3. We've proven previously that the alternating group is normal inside of S3. The easiest way to see that, it has index 2, therefore it's normal. The cosets associated to the alternating group are first itself. One of the cosets is always the subgroup itself. Now because you're index 2, the other coset uh, is actually going to be everything else. So you have the even permutations and the odd permutations. And for S3, that is you're going to take the identity with the three cycles and then the two cycles as well. Okay, those are going to be our cosets. And so to form the factor group, these are then going to be the two elements of the factor group. Okay, so the factor group contains two elements for which I'm going to sh I'm show you the Cayley table with the coset multiplication over here. The alternating group is gonna serve as the identity element. If you take the alternating group times itself, you get back the alternate, alternating group. We saw that in our first lemma. If you take the alternating group times the other coset, according to coset multiplication, you take the identity times one, two, which is one, two, and this is gonna be the coset right here. And I want you to kind of verify that. If I take A3, if I take A3 and I times it by one, two, A3, right? This is a product of sets. So you're gonna take one, one, two, three, one, three, two, and then you're gonna times that by, I'm gonna scooch this over, and you're gonna times that by one, two, one, three, and two, three. And so when you look at all the possible products right here, you're gonna get the identity distributed through, that's easy. So you're gonna get one, two, three, one, three, two, and then you're gonna get two, three, like so, okay? What I want you to convince yourself now is when you take the product of one, two, three, and one, two, you're gonna get that one goes to two, two goes to three, so you end up getting this friend right here. When you do one, two, three with one, three, you're gonna see that one goes to three, three goes to one, so one is fixed, and you end up getting a two, three right here. And when you take one, two, three times two, three, what you're gonna see happening there is one goes to two, and then two is gonna to go to three, which then goes back to one, so you end up with this element right here. So you got the same three elements, it just showed up a second time. Uh, and now if you take one, three, two times one, two, you get one goes to two, two goes to one, so one is fixed, and you're gonna see that 
uh, one is fixed, so you're going to get a 2, 3 right there. Then you take 1, 2, 3 times 1, 3. 1 goes to 3. 3 goes to 2. So you're going to get 1 goes to 2, which is this one right here. And then finally, you get 1, 2, 3 times 2, 3. You're going to get that 2 goes to 3, but then 3 goes back to 2. So 2 is fixed, and you get this element right here. All right, so when you take the product of A3 with 1, 2, A3, you get the three, the three two cycles, um, and they actually show up three times. But, you know, we don't really care about the multiplicity of such things. Well, I mean, I do. I, I certainly, as an algebraic combinatorist, I really care about the multiplicity of those things. Uh, but, you know, we, we don't need to worry about that in this lecture right here. But the point is, when we take the product of A3 and uh, 1, 2, A3, we get back 1, 2, A3. And then if you take 1, 2, A3 times 1, 2, A3, you get back A3. And so this is a product, right? If I take this set right here and I square it, you're going to get back these three elements, and they're going to show up with multiplicity three times. That can get a little bit tedious, as you saw in that. The cool thing about coset multiplication is that you don't have to draw out all of the combinations. You only have to look at the representatives. So you get 1 times 1 is going to give you 1. You're going to get 1 times 1, 2 gives you 1, 2. You just have to look at the representatives, right? 1, 2 times 1, 2 gives you 1. And so that speeds up this calculation so, so quickly. Now, when you look at this Cayley table right here, uh, this Cayley table looks a lot like uh, the, the, well, the cyclic group mod 2. And that's because... Uh, we see that A3 mod A, sorry, excuse me, S3 mod A3 is actually isomorphic to Z2. It's a cyclic group of order two. And in fact, this is something we see in more generality. If you take Sn and you mod out An, you always end up with Z2. One important thing to know about factor groups here is that if you have a group G mod N and you look at its order, well, the order is the number of elements inside the group. But this is this group of all the cosets. So the order is going to be the number of cosets. The order of this group is going to be the index of this normal subgroup. Well, since A, An has index 2, this group will always be order 2. And there's only one group of order 2, which is Z2 right there. Uh, let's look at another example. Let's take this time the example. We're going to take the integers. And we're going to look at the normal subgroup Z, 3Z. So we're taking multiples of 3. Well, this group has index 3. Right? There's, there's three options, right? Um, you're either going to have multiples of three, so those numbers which are congruent to zero mod three, one mod three, and two mod three. Okay? And so when you start combining these things together, what do you get? Well, if you take a number, which is a multiple of three, and you can add it to a multiple of three, you get a multiple of three. If you add it, if you take zero, uh, that is, when the remainder is zero and you add it to the remainder one, you're going to get a remainder one. And when you take the remainder zero and combine it with a number which has remainder two. When you divide by three, you're going to get a remainder two. Okay, and when you go through all of these things, right? So this here is our identity. We get zero plus three x right here. So this should just look like the the row right above it. Okay, if you take one and zero, you get one. If you take one and one, you get two. If you get one and two, you're going to get three. A three plus a multiple of three. But hey, you can actually suck that into the three z there, and actually this is the same thing, right? And when you look again, go through all these combinations, this Cayley table right here is the exact same Cayley table as working addition mod 3, you know, up to relabeling of the symbols. And we, in fact, see that, that Z mod 3Z is isomorphic to the cyclic group of order 3. And this happens in greater generality, right? If you take Z mod NZ, this is equal to, this is isomorphic to the, this quotient group is isomorphic to the cyclic group uh, mod N. Uh, let's see. This we'll we'll do one more example and then we'll finish up the video there. So let's look at the dihedral group, right? That dihedral group DN has a very natural normal subgroup that is the rotational subgroup. Uh, we mentioned that in the previous video. That I mean, you can see that because it's index two. Um, you can also see that that every rotation, the only conjugates are itself and its inverse. So the rotation subgroup is a union of consciousness classes. So it's going to be normal. It's a normal subgroup. So we can mod out the normal, this normal subgroup. If we take the dihedral group and we mod out the rotations, well, then we're going to get back Z2, okay? Because, uh, like, again, we saw this above with the with the symmetric group. If you mod out the, the, this is subgroup, the rotation subgroup has index 2. So when you mod it out, you have to get a group of order 2. There's only one possibility, which is the cyclic group of order 2. Now, you'll notice, that, of course, that this rotational subgroup R is itself a cyclic group of order N. 
it's isomorphic to n. And so sometimes in the dihedral group, you actually denote it as zn, or more commonly zn without the blackboard font there. And so you'll see this, that D, dn mod out its cyclic subgroup uh, turns out to be z2 as well. And so this gives you some examples of computations involving these quotient groups. We'll, of course, do some more of these in the future. In the next chapter of Judson's textbook, chapter 11, uh, we're going to introduce the notion of a homomorphism, which will eventually lead to our the, what's sometimes called the fundamental uh, theorem of homomorphisms, or what we'll call the first isomorphism theorem that tells you that there is a deep connection between the quotient groups we introduced in this video and homomorphisms, which we'll introduce in the next chapter.